Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Today I'd like to share a uh, history of uh, our family's IH dealership that uh, we had in uh, Dakin, Nebraska, in a small town. It was called Schmidt Implements for many years, and uh, it was started uh, uh, a long time ago, <laughs> back in uh, the uh, early 1900s. We'll get into it here. Uh, today we'll talk a little bit about the beginnings of the dealership, uh, the early years, and then we'll kind of go decade by decade of, of some of the milestones that occurred in those uh, for our dealership and a little bit of history of the company as well, uh, some of the things that was going on. Um, then we'll talk about the, uh, I'll give you a little bit of an inside look at some of the operations of the dealership and, uh, and I'll, also a little bit about the company and then we'll wrap it up from there. So in Nebraska, we have two big reds. One is Big Red Football and the other is Internet, Big Red International Harvester Tractors. And uh, growing up it, during the 70s, uh, on Saturday afternoons when it was a football Saturday, the radio would be on back in the shop of our dealership. We'd all be listening to the game and, and cheering the Huskers on as they, they played. And uh, so uh, it was a very memorable special time for, for me uh, growing up in the dealership. And uh, that's one of the memories I have of, of the dealership of listening to those football games on uh, Saturday afternoons. A uh, little bit about Nebraska and where our dealership was located. Uh, we were located out in the southeast corner of the state. Uh, the county name was Jefferson and in the northwest corner of the uh, county there was a little town, little town called Dakin. Our dealership was not a big dealership. Uh, we weren't one of the XL dealers or anything but it was a, a dealership and we served our cu customers faithfully for many years and uh, it's a good farming a lot of good farm ground in our area and uh, so we were able to uh, as the farmers prospered we prospered a little bit of history about Dakin it was founded back in 1887 it was named after uh, a man named John Dakin uh, his claim to fame was uh, he was he worked for the railroad back east uh, the uh, when President Lincoln was shot he was the conductor on the funeral train that uh, brought the president's uh, train and his, his casket and body from Washington DC to uh, Cleveland and uh, he bought land uh, in the area where my town is uh, back in 1860 1869 and uh, then later sold that land uh, when the railroads were building a lot of the railroads started east to west when they were building but they didn't go north and south much and so there was a need for north and south lines to connect the east and west lines and so uh, they started this line that came up and that's when our town was founded was when this north south one the first north south lines was founded uh, or, or built and uh, our town was founded in july 1887. Uh, the first building was built in 18 uh, july 4th of 1887 and it's amazing how fast things would go up back then in, in a matter of months a town could just spring up and dakin was no exception to that uh that by uh uh, one of the newspaper reports said by uh, September, I think, of uh, or August of 1887, you know, there was a bank, there was a, the depot was built, the tracks were laid, uh, and businesses were, were, were sprouting up. So uh, it, it all happens, happened very fast back then. Um, Kansas City uh, and Omaha Railroad was uh, the railroad that built that line through our town. And the town was platted, and uh, then the, the business were quickly established after that to serve the farmers in that area. And it's a good farm ground. There's a lot of farmers that were selling in that area at that time. So the beginnings of our dealership go back to my great grandfather. His name was uh, Harry Schmidt. His wife's name was Emma. His nickname was Dick. We uh, always called him Dick Schmidt. Um, I wasn't around, but I just remember my dad and grandpa talking about that. Uh, he had three sons, Ralph, uh, Sidney, and Winterford, and then two daughters, Hazel and uh, Beulah. So uh, he farmed outside of Dakin, lived a mile, mile west and a mile south of town. It was a, our home fam family farm. We still have that land. Um, and as my uh, grandfather and his brothers were uh, getting through uh, the uh, eighth grade, that's all the higher the education was at that time, back in the early 1900s, was eighth grade, uh, he decided that he needed something for the boys to do. And so he decided to uh, get a, uh, you know, look into setting up a farm equipment dealership. So these are uh, these are the pictures, uh, the wedding pictures of uh, my 
great, or my grandpa and uh, his two brothers. Uh, there's uh, Ralph and Alfreda, and then uh, Sid, he married uh, Amy, and uh, then Winnie, he uh, married uh, Violet. The, uh, when uh, my grandpa, great grandpa contacted companies about possible leadership options, he got responses back from International Harvester <laughs> and also the Case Company. So we were a Case IH dealer before it ever had ever happened. So. <laughs> um, the business was organized in 1915. Like I said, we started with International and Case. Um, we uh, opened the dealership, our first building, what had been a former car dealership. And there you see the, the first building in the background. Uh, there on the right, with all the cars in front. That, wasn't, that was before us, that was about 1910 that photograph was taken. And uh, we uh, opened in that building and then immediately the, the Great grandpa and the bro brothers started construction on a second building, which was, was just adjacent to the east of that building. And uh, they, uh, that second building was made out of cement, cement blocks, but we didn't buy the cement blocks. To save cost, they made the cement blocks out of the farm. They, uh, every day, they would make a batch of blocks, uh, pour them, and then the previous day's blocks, they'd break, uh, they you know, had those out of the farms, and uh, they'd put those on their wagon, and they'd haul them to town and they'd start building the building that way. And uh, so they were able to build that building with all the construction materials uh, that were made on, you know, the blocks were all made on the farm and uh, it was to save cost. It was to make it more cost effective. Um, this is uh, the second building then that was right next to the first building. They used both buildings for many years, but this was kind of the, the main operations once they got that, that building open. There was an office area, there was a, uh, the parts department and uh, we had the shop in the back and there was an area for showroom as well. So there you, on the right you see the, uh, the uh, shop area, uh, it was in the back, it, uh, you know, at the time it, it looks very primitive, I've always thought, man it looks primitive and I remember this building, the building still actually is part of it standing today yet, uh, it always it seemed like it was very antique or very ancient and, uh, but uh, I was looking through so a catalog, go to the next slide, that uh, you know shows in, uh, this was published in uh, an IH publication in the late 20s that shows other shops that were considered best in the class at that time. And uh, so it's, they seem very comparable. So, <laughs> and, uh, so I, I thought that was kind of interesting how that worked. Uh, that we had, a, you know, our dealership was a state of the art dealership when it was open. Um, so we started in 1915. The name of the business was Harry Schmidt and Sons. Uh, we were selling International Harvester, you know, uh, at that time, you know, the, your, the Harvester had, had been through the merger. You had some dealers that were Deering dealers, you had some dealers that were McCormick dealers, but, you know, to us, it, we sold whatever the company offered. It didn't matter whether it was McCormick or Deering, we sold it. Uh, so we had uh, McCormick Deering equipment, the uh, Titan Mogul tractors, uh, binders, thrashing machines, stationary engines, and even cream, Pimrose cream separators out. If you saw that earlier picture there, the first building, there was a sign on it said Pimrose uh, uh, cream separators. Uh, well, also, we sold case machinery, including thrashing machines. At some point, that contract ended. I don't know exactly when, but uh, it, uh, we did sell for several years case equipment as well. <coughs> A little bit about the company. So, at, you know, during this time, 1915-25, you know, the company you know, had, was entering its teen years of the merger. Uh, they were developing new products jointly. Uh, you know, mechanization of farming was underway. The horse was being pushed aside by uh, tractors and, and equipment. Uh, and the company was in a huge growth mode. Uh, they were expanding. They were developing their U.S. networks, distribution networks. Um, and they were rapidly adding dealerships and trying in farming areas where there was farm and also they, they tried to concentrate where there was rail service as well. So if you uh, had farming areas with rail service, they were looking for dealerships in that area and they'd be contacting you know, like blacksmith shops, uh, hardware stores, grain elevators. Or, uh, some of the one picture I've got, uh, which we'll see a little bit later, you know, has a list of all the dealers from that year that the photograph was taken. And you know, you see sort of Farmer's Co-op Elevator was actually a dealership established there in some of those towns. Uh, garages, and sometimes, you know, new greenfields like, like ours was, it was a new, it was a new site. We, we started an existing building, built, built a new building, so. Um, and by 1925, there were, there were three dealerships in Jefferson County alone. 
one down in Steel City, another one in Plymouth, and then one in Dakin. So as part of the distribution network the company was setting up, they would use what they call branch offices. So this is a map I'd found of, a, of where a lot of the uh, branch offices were located at in this time, time frame. So uh, if you go uh, look at the, uh, the next slide, I think, uh, yeah, there was over, for on the ag side, there was over 100 general line branch offices at that time, and then Motor Truck had even more, they had 153 uh, offices. And in Nebraska, we had two branch offices. One was in Omaha, which served the northern half of Nebraska, and the, the uh, second was in Lincoln, uh, which served the, the southern half of Nebraska, the dealers in that area, and also the, the northern edge of Kansas, the northern border, along the northern border, or the Nebraska to Kansas border. Uh, branch offices supported the dealers and also farmers. A lot of the branch offices at that time had retail operations as well. Uh, that operated out that and they had service department and but they also they had company employees there that uh, you know were helping assist the dealers they had also a warehouse typically for uh, the dealers to come pick up equipment because a lot of time they would batch ship the company you know the factories would batch ship the equipment to the branch offices and then the dealers would come pick it up from the branch office and uh, so the, I know my grandpa and dad talking about you know used to go to Lincoln a lot and then Omaha uh, to pick up equipment and uh, so that's how they worked, worked with those branch offices. Another important milestone in the history of the company was the introduction of the Farmal Regular. Uh, that uh, revolutionized farming. It was a low cost uh, economical tractor that uh, you know, could do, it was very versatile, had a lot of, a lot of things it could be used for. And uh, when the International introduced that, it really took off and uh, sales soared. Um, You've maybe seen some of the advertisements about train loads of farm malls. Well, that is true. They, they had train loads of farm malls coming out of Rock Island. Uh, this picture here on the right, you see, uh, is a picture I, I've always loved. I, I like trains and I like IH. So uh, this was a dealer, uh, the branch office in Lincoln put this uh, photo out when the, one of the first train loads of farm malls came into the, to the Lincoln branch. They uh, took a picture of it, and it lists all, you see, it's hard to read, but it lists all the dealerships that were participated had tractors on that train. And so my grandpa's, our dealership is listed there. Uh, and uh, this is the first load of farm all regulars in that came to our dealership. And they're all lined up there in front of the, the dealership. They could put about six, six tractors on each, each flat car. And... Uh, then they, they brought you know they brought in a, our town we unloaded it and they had them on display out there in front in front of the dealership so that was the actually that was a picture where it said primrose cream separator so um so a little more about the early years from the 20 to 29 uh you have the company our, our harry schmidt and sons and then in 1923 my dad was born harold and uh there you have a picture of him on the on the right there he's got his uh his little tricycle tractor there, and uh, you've got Sid there on the uh, old uh, 1530, I think. Uh, they're dragging the road for whatever reason. And uh, so, the, so now you have three generations of Schmidt's involved with the family, uh, the dealership. And uh, my grandpa started, when the dealership started, my grandpa was only 14 years old. He, you know, completed eighth grade, and uh, at the uh, he was 14 at that time. So uh, he grew up in the leadership. Here you see the next generation growing up in the leadership as well. Here's an ad from uh, the, uh, actually it was in the local paper there, Dakin, a little small town. We, we had a newspaper, every little small town had a newspaper back in those days. And so this is an ad from 1929 advertising about the new uh, pull type combines, the Harvester Thrasher. And there on the right is uh, one of the first three uh, Harvester Thrasher pull types that we sold. Now it's unfortunate it's being pulled by a John Deere, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, it still worked. And uh, there, uh, Charlie William and Charlie Klein bought one of those very first Harvester Thrashers that uh, we sold. In 1925, we added the motor, motor truck line. Uh, it started selling IH motor trucks. Um, we provided sales and service and parts, and uh, we were mainly selling medium duty trucks for hauling grain for farmers to haul grain to town. And, uh, and might have sold some pickups too, but I think mainly it's mainly started out medium duty trucks. So, so here's a picture of, of Dakin from that era of the 20s. Um, it was a very prosperous time for our town, a lot of growth. Um, 
you had farm uh, mechanization taking hold. Uh, the business and the community grew. Uh, a lot of you know people moved to town and, and farmers moving into the area. Land was being settled, so it was a very uh, prosperous time for the town. Um, we also had a some competition. Uh, a John Deere dealer opened in 1922. The E. W. Rosner and Sons. They uh, opened a John Deere dealership. They also sold cars. And my grandpa welcomed that. He liked having that competition because they just built they built a building just on the end of, other end of the block where our dealership was. So we were right next to each other, and he didn't mind having uh, that competition because he thought, well, if somebody came to look at the John Deere's, they might walk down the street and look at the IHs too, and he'd have an opportunity to talk to them about an IH tractor. So he always welcomed that competition. And actually, when the dealer the John Deere dealer closed, I think they closed in the early 50s. He, my grandpa was very sad about that because he says, you know, that, that was competition was always good because I you know, gave him another chance, another opportunity to talk to a customer about, about you know, checking into IH, looking into IH. Um, and also, uh, then my dad started, he got old enough, he started helping in the business. And uh, my uh, Uncle Harvey on my mom's side shared his story with me some years back before he passed away about when uh, his dad bought their first farm all tractor from my granddad. Um, they brought it out, it, was on, it had steel wheels, and my dad came along and, and uh, had to put, once they got it out to the farm there where my mom was growing up, and that was maybe the first contact my mom and dad maybe ever seen each other, I don't know. Uh, my dad was like six, seven years old at that time, and uh, so they had to put the lugs on the, the steel wheels, and so my dad was helping put those steel, uh, lugs on that steel wheel, you know, sticking the bolt in, holding the bolt, and grandpa would be tightening it. And uh, my Uncle Harvey was a little bit jealous. He was a teenager, and he thought he should be able to help with that. And here my dad, just a little tight, uh, putting those, helping put those steel lugs on, on the, that, the, those uh, steel tires. So um, We had some other life changes in, uh, the, uh, at the end of the 20s. Uh, my great-grandfather passed away unexpectedly in 1929. So then the boys decided that uh, my gra grandpa, Ralph, and uh, uh, Sid, would continue with the uh, the business, and my uh, uncle Winnie, great uncle actually, uh, he decided to take over the family farm. So the brothers, you know, split up there a little bit. Winterford took over the farm, and Ralph and Sid uh, continued running the business. Uh, they changed the name from uh, Harry Schmidt and Sons then to Schmidt Brothers. And uh, Sid did the sales. He was very outgoing, uh, affable guy. He liked to talk and visit, so he did a lot of the sales. And my grandfather, you know, run the parts and service department. He did some sales too at that time. Um, the other notable thing that happened there at the end of 29 was the great stock market, stock, stock market crash. And uh, that ushered in the depression era. And also then in the 30s, we had to suffer through the dust bowl as well. So it was a very trying time. Um, the key thing was survival. <laughs> Not only for the farmers, but also for our dealership. Uh, since farmers didn't have a lot of money, cash was very tight, they had to keep what they had and use what they had. So parts and service became very key in keeping the dealership and keeping cash flow coming in. Uh, so servicing those tractors, keeping them maintained uh, and working. Uh, we also added, started doing custom work for farmers, uh, doing corn shelling, thrashing, uh, and some trucking. Uh, they would frequently uh, Farmers would need uh, cattle hauled to Omaha. They would, uh, Grandpa would, they'd get the truck, they'd drive the truck to Omaha, take the cattle to the stockyard, and then on the way back they'd stop in Lincoln and pick up equipment. So you did do what you had to do to survive. Also we added uh, three, uh, at various times, some car lines too, to help diversify a little bit. They, one time we sold Dodge uh, vehicles and then Buick and also Studebaker at various times. So. Uh, here, during so in the Depression area, it was a tough time. Uh, I know I had a lasting impact on my mom, and, and uh, she told me many stories about uh, depression. But here you see some farmers at work during the, the 30s there from some of our, our local customers. We got a F20 or a regular there working on uh, uh, running a thrash machine. Uh, and then, uh, uh, well, that guy, uh, other Albert Meske, he was a neighbor when I was a kid. Um, he had, there you see him and his family, some of his kids uh, on the on the formal regular there. As uh, as it got through the 30s, towards the latter part of the 30s, the economy started improving a little bit. Still was tough, but you know the sales did start improving. Uh, there was uh, the the war effort was on the horizon, and our and the United States was helping support Europe. 
there on uh, England on the Glen Lease, and so that was helping to improve things. Grain prices started improving a little bit, and uh, they also in 1939 on the Port Milestone the Company was the letter series of farm holes were introduced. So uh, uh, there on the right you see uh, one of the last uh, F20s that we sold. Uh, to uh, William Endorf, that the family still has that tractor today yet. Uh, they that's kind of, kind of a keepsake family tractor for them. And uh, uh, there on the lower left, you see uh, uh, one or another one of our customers, uh, Pete Hauser. He was using the old McCormick Deering binder there, cutting cutting wheat. <laughs> so as the uh, 40s began uh, for uh, for our dealerships, and changes took place. My dad graduated high school. Of course, 1941, December 7th, that's the day of infamy. Every all, all well know uh, Pearl Harbor being attacked and drawing the U.S. into World War II. Um, my dad, he, uh, he graduated high school. He, uh, you know, where effort was on, he didn't get drafted right away, but he went down to Wichita to work uh, at Boeing at the aircraft plant down in Wichita, which years later I went to work there as well. Um, but then he did get drafted in 1943 and went into the service. Um, we had strong sales. It was a very good time. Uh, grain, mice, per, mar, grain prices were good, um, but they had rationing going on as well. So every tractor, you, you couldn't get everything you'd like to get, but whatever you did get, it was sold. So it sold very quickly. Um, we continued doing custom work as well uh, in that time, and also uh, IH had scrap drives. It, it promoted, and our dealership helped participate in that as well to, to get, with the war effort, get provide new scrap metal to go be re recycled into new war things, things for war or whatever. So uh, as World War II ended, uh, my dad returned home then from the service uh, and him and grandpa and Sid, they began plans for constructing a new building. And it was a prototype building. I remember my mom talking about seeing the, the kit that the dealer had when they wanted to build a new building. And so they were you know, laying out floor plans and everything. And, and uh, also at this time, Sid, his health was starting to have issues or he was having problems and so he decided to retire and also so then at that time then they changed the name to Ralph Schmidt Implement. Uh, then a few years later they, my dad actually officially joined the business as a partner. It was you know between my grandpa and my dad but they didn't get my dad's name on the contract with IH at that time. And uh, they, they also then changed the name to Schmidt Implement at that time, and that was the, for the remainder of our, our leadership, that was the name of our leadership. Uh, here's a picture of my grandpa and grandma taking a little break from the business there, relaxing, and it was a busy time, <coughs> building the new building and, and running the business, uh, and then getting my dad involved in it. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, so here you see uh, 1950, the completed construction of the new building, the prototype building. Uh, there. Uh, we did not put the pylon, the red IH pylon that a lot of the dealerships had at that time. Um, and I asked Dad, why didn't we do that one time? And he said, well, we always, those pylons always had leak. Every time it rained, you'd get water coming into the building. And so a lot of dealerships had troubles with that. So that's why they opted not to put the, the big red pylon. But we did put the red neon IH sign on top of the building there in the front. And, uh, and in the back area, the high bay area was the service bay area. If you look in those windows, you can, through the windows, you can just faintly make out right over here an outline. There's a formal, either an H or an M tractor sitting there in the showroom. On the, the uh, your far, to your left, is, is our uh, showroom for refrigeration. So uh, we, we sold refrigeration products when those came out that I had introduced that, and then they were quite successful with that. There you, there you see a better close-up of the refrigeration display. You see a deep freeze there on, on the display. You see the, the advertising banners and had the big, big ribbons around, ribbon construction there that you've maybe seen at some of the shows uh, featuring the refrigeration line. Next one. This is the back of the, the building uh, that uh, you see a, a new Farm OEM setting there. Uh, just one thing to note, the, the big windows there, those were, were con or window glass blocks that we used uh, and that was to allow more natural lighting into the, into the building there in the service area. Here's the, uh, sh the showroom, the parts area there my grandpa on the opening day of the new business. And uh, you see we had this, the typical uh, you know, parts bins and, and end caps on the parts bins. Above where my grandpa was standing, we had the McCormick Deering and, 
uh, international let, let, letter, wood letters that we, I still have those. Um, and uh, it's one little story to tell about the furnishings, where we got the furnishings for uh, the, our business. The uh, branch office at that time happened to be going, they were going to remodel, they were going to change all the, their interior furnishings. And my grandpa find out, found out about that, that they were going to uh, do that, and we were building our new building. So he checked into it and inquired if, if those the old furnishings would be for sale. And the, dealer, the branch office said, sure, yeah, we'll sell them. So my grandpa bought all those, those interior furnishings, the parts bins, the counters, the display tri-level tri display boards, that all came from the branch office out of Lincoln, Nebraska. They hauled truckloads after truckloads <laughs> of fixtures uh, from Lincoln to Dakin and set it all up there in our, our new building. So, um, so this kind of gives you a little idea of the uh, layout of the uh, what it looked like the front half was of course parts department in our, in our showroom area we had an office area as well where uh, mom did mom and dad did a lot of the accounting book work and then the other side of the office was where my grandpa would talk to customers and and do pricing and, and make deals right so uh in the back we had a, a washroom parts uh, paint room area a uh, number of service bays where we could do service we had a tool room area as well, where uh, like the valve grinding machines and, and drill press were located uh, to uh, to do work on on the, the equipment. So, so uh, you know, as through the 50s, and you know, my my grandfather, he was you know kind of the main manager. He was trying to manage an oversight. He like he do sales and service calls. Uh, we did custom, We started doing custom windrowing in the 50s. We had a lot of uh, dairy farmers in our area, so there was a lot of hay uh, production. And uh, International was coming out with wind rowers, and uh, so uh, we'd ordered one, we couldn't sell it, so Grandpa decided, okay, we'll, we'll start doing custom work to you, put it, in, put it in service. And so we, we would do that. And uh, the other thing is we sold a lot of balers in the 50s, uh, old square balers. My Grandpa got very good at repairing those balers. He, he went to school and he studied up on them. And I remember as a little kid in the 70s, still go, you know, going out whenever somebody had a baler problem, that was, that was grandpa's job. So we, I would go along with him and we'd go out in those hot hay fields and we'd, we'd work on those nodders to get him, get him working. And he knew what to do. I was always amazed. I, I never could figure him out, but he, he knew what to do. Um, so, and my dad, he was kind of the shop foreman or manager. He, he managed the shop, kept, kept the men working busy uh, with, uh, with various chores and, and working on equipment. Uh, he uh, also helped do set up and inventory, um, and also the mowing our lots were in the facility, keeping up the facility and grounds. Um, my dad also got married in 1950 to my mom, who's here today with us, and uh, my mom Bernice. <laughs> She's our, uh, she was our bookkeeper. She, uh, she uh, went to uh, school. She was a school teacher as well for many years, and uh, she kept our books. And uh, she helped set up our accounting system that we used. I uh, didn't have computers back in those days, so it was all by hand. And uh, she'd mail out monthly statements to cus customers, that, you know, when their bills were due. And uh, she had to she had to go through the old ledgers that we had that that uh, Sid and Grandpa and to reconcile all those. Uh, she went through and identified a number of customers that hadn't paid for a long time, and trying to you know collect those bills and send them statements. Uh, one story she's shared with me was uh, the county roads department would come and get frequently get oil from us for the roads maintainer the road maintainers but my grandpa would never send the bill into the county office to get paid so my mom went through all these records and some all added it all up here's all the all the bills <laughs> she sent them a statement and the county commissioners got that and they had kind of had a little come apart because <laughs> you know county government government any government runs on a fiscal year so there was there was oil from many, many past years that had been never collected or billed, and then here they get this large bill at one time, and so that caused some heartburn for the county commissioners. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, she, uh, she got those bills. She also took care of paying our bills and, and doing payroll for the, the employees. Uh, in the 50s as well, uh, training was a big thing for the dealers. Uh, my grandfather uh, went to Chicago. They set up a tra central training facility in Chicago for, to teach dealers on the, some of the basics of sales and management of a dealership. And my grandfather attended that as well. He's there on the front row, on your, be on your, uh, your right, there, the first uh, chair on the right. 
And uh, so he went through that training in 1951. And then in 1952, the next slide, uh, my dad, Harold, went, went through that training, same course as well. And he's on the front row on the left. And uh, so uh, they went to the, you know, got through that management school and how, you know, the best ways, pra practices, running a dealership, management of that dealership. So uh, this is just uh, this other, uh, our letterhead, some of the stationery we had from back in 1950. Actually, I got, got the original right here. I brought along today. You can look at it afterwards. And, you know, it shows what we, we had uh, uh, McCormick steering or IH tractors and uh, equipment. And then also the refrigeration line and uh, the motor trucks as well. And there's a couple of trucks there. Uh, one gentleman worked for us at Auto Journey part time. He was a farmer. And uh, he would do, we'd usually have him a lot of times. He would do, uh, when we had equipment in Al or Lincoln at that time, he would go to Lincoln, pick it up, bring it back. He got to like him that doing that trucking. So he started his own business, a truck, and bought, bought a, a truck there from my grandpa. And also he bought a pickup my grandpa back then and he had that auto had that uh, pickup for many many years I mean, he always would be driving around town <laughs> this good old, good old truck the refrigeration line uh, was was came actually in early or late 1949 they introduced the uh, refrigeration that was one of Fowler McCormick's who was CEO at the time that was one of his initiatives because he wanted IH to be a household name in every household and uh, so that was one way he thought that could accomplish that that he could accomplish that goal was selling refrigeration. Well, the refrigeration line sold very well in the farming areas. Uh, we sold a lot of refrigerators and freezer, freezers in just a small town, uh, but they didn't sell very well in the city, big cities. And that's where really your, a lot of your potential customers were. And that, there just, was just too much competition, I think, in the big cities. I don't know, maybe they didn't market it well, but uh, I know when the IH made the decision to get out of the refrigeration line, uh, that was the thing they said, yeah, in the rural areas, the refrigeration lines sold very, very well, but in the big cities, it never did sell very well. So that's when they decided to exit that business. Um, I got a little summary there. Some of the totals from 49 to 55, the five, six years that I made refrigerators and freezers, we sold 72 freezers, 40 refrigerators, and three air conditioners. So. <laughs> One of the other things that the branch office in Lincoln did at certain times of year, they would have a special order periods for seasonal type equipment. And uh, so one year they had an you know, ordering period for balers. And usually when you have these ordering periods, if you ordered a certain quantity of balers, as an incentive, they give you some discounts on it for the dealers. So there's an opportunity for a little extra profit to help encourage orders. So the branch office there had a promotion for balers. And uh, so they, you know, solicited from all their dealers to so place orders for balers, and so the dealers did. And then when they had, those, so those orders went into Memphis, and when the Memphis plant got those balers built and shipped them out, they uh, had all the dealers come to Lincoln and then took this photo, which is really kind of neat. And uh, you don't see it on this below where it says International Dealers, International Harvester Dealers, Sales and Salesmen. There's a list of all the dealers in their hometowns where those dealers were located at. And so it gives you a little snippet of, you know, 